I'm Dr. Chip Levee, a professor of medicine at the Ashna Heart and Vascular Institute, Ashna Clinical School, the University of Queensland School of Medicine here in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I'm here to discuss our paper, which is entitled, The Impact of Cardiorespiratory Fitness on the Obesity Paradox in Patients with Heart Failure, which will be published in the March 2013 issue of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. I'd first like to acknowledge, congratulate, and thank my esteemed group of co-authors from many prestigious institutions across the United States and Europe, and particularly the lead or senior author, Dr. Ross Arena, for the excellent help uh, throughout the preparation of this publication, and mainly for allowing me to use the data from their large cardiopulmonary stress testing data bank for this quite important paper. I think we all recognize that overweightness and obesity adversely affects almost all of the cardiovascular disease risk factors and certainly significantly contributes to the development of coronary heart disease and hypertension, both of which are strongly related to the development of heart failure. Also, overweightness and obesity have adverse effects on systolic and especially diastolic ventricular dysfunction and lead to abnormalities on left ventricular geometry, a topic that I've published a bunch on, which all contribute to an increased risk of heart failure. And certainly, population studies, and the main one is the Framingham Heart Study, shows that heart failure significantly increases in proportion to overweightness and obesity. In fact, as BMI increases, so does the prevalence of heart failure. But despite this, an obesity paradox exists. And that means that patients with established cardiovascular diseases, such as heart failure, the overweight and obese tend to have a better short and long-term prognosis than do their lean counterparts with the same disease. And numerous studies and meta-analyses have shown this. But there were also recent papers that indicate that cardiorespiratory fitness affects the relationship between adiposity and subsequent prognosis in cardiovascular disease. And there's three major papers during the last two years that have assessed this in patients with coronary heart disease. One is by Kashish Gould from the Mayo Clinic. This paper was published two years ago in the American Heart Journal. A second was by Paul McCauley in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings with a large set, over 7,000 patients referred for stress testing at the Veterans Administration Hospital. And a third was also by Paul McCauley this past May in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, and I was a co-author of that paper, of 10,000 patients in the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study. All of these studies had a common theme. It showed that those with high levels of cardiorespiratory fitness had a better prognosis, and there was no obesity paradox. But in the low fitness patients, they had a poor prognosis, and there was a strong obesity paradox, meaning that the lower weight patients with low fitness had a much worse prognosis than did the overweight and the obese patients. So the paradox existed in the low fitness patients. Now interesting, in this last paper by Paul McCauley in the May 2012 proceedings, he showed that the paradox existed with low fitness for BMI, for percent body fat, and even for central obesity or waist circumference, showing that in coronary disease patients, fitness significantly affects the relationship between adiposity and cardiovascular disease prognosis. Well, in our current study, we assessed 2,066 patients with heart failure. The average age was around 56, about three-fourths were men. The average ejection fraction was about 28%. And these were all from a cardiopulmonary stress testing data bank from a multi-center study. We followed these patients for five years, and the average follow-up was 25 months, so just over two years, to assess total mortality. Now, we excluded the underweight patients with BMIs under 18.5 because many studies show that these are especially at extremely high risk. And, and when we followed the patients over time, there was a 4.5% annual mortality rate, 212 deaths during follow-up. Now, we know that heart failure is a very uh, high-risk condition, 
but 4.5% annualized mortality doesn't seem excessively high. But keep in mind that these were all heart failure patients who were managed at top medical centers. They were aggressively treated with standard heart failure medications, and obviously they had to be well enough to at least do a cardi cardiopulmonary stress test, so there may be some selection bias. But we also precisely assessed fitness in these patients, and we assessed fitness by cardiopulmonary stress testing, or peak oxygen consumption, or peak VO2. And we basically divided the patients into highly fit versus low fit, and we used the standard cutoff of peak VO2 of 14 cc's of oxygen per kilogram per minute. And this was the standard that was proposed by Donna Mancini back in the late 80s and early 90s, and has been used repeatedly in many studies as a way to separate heart failure patients into those with a relatively good prognosis as opposed to those with a poor prognosis that need more aggressive treatment and in the past really became candidates for heart transplantation. Now, not that 14 is a very high level. In fact, much higher levels would be the average in the population. But this level is a pretty good way uh, to separate patients. And using this separation, we tried to assess the impact of cardiorespiratory fitness on the obesity paradox and heart failure to see if it affected the relationship in heart failure the way it did previously in coronary heart disease. So in the patients who had high fitness, defined as greater than 14, cc's of oxygen per kilogram per minute, they had a quite good prognosis. During follow-up, their annual mortality rate was only 2.8% per year. And in these patients, there was no obesity paradox. Their prognosis was equally as good regardless of their level of BMI. However, in the low fitness patients, they had nearly a three-fold higher mortality rate, an annual mortality rate of 8.2 percent per year and they had a strong obesity paradox so the prognosis was particularly poor in those with low fitness who had normal BMIs between 18.5 and 25 whereas the prognosis was considerably better in the overweight patients between 25 and 30 and in the obese patients greater than 30 uh, kg per meter squared indicating an obesity paradox with low fitness in heart failure similar to what has previously been shown in studies of coronary heart disease. Now, we should acknowledge limitations, and there's five major limitations to these data. The first, as I've already mentioned, is selection bias. These were all patients who were handled at major medical centers, aggressively treated, and all were at least well enough to undergo a cardiopulmonary stress test. Second, we only assessed BMI, and we have published and others have too, that BMI is not perfect for assessing body fatness, and we can do better probably with percent body fat, with waist circumference of central obesity, waist to hip ratios, and other methods uh, may be better than just BMI. Third, we just measured cardiorespiratory fitness, peak VO2, which is extremely important. But there's another part of physical fitness, that is muscular strength which is also very important. We've published that that's associated with a better prognosis. And uh, there's, there's been papers by some of my co-authors uh, recently that's demonstrated that heart failure patients with higher body fat have more muscular strength. And we did not measure muscular strength in this cohort. Fourth, our data was not powered enough to assess more extreme obesity. So we didn't have enough statistical power to assess patients with class 2 obesity, that's BMI between 35 and 39.9, or even more importantly, class 3 or morbid obesity, which is a BMI greater than or equal to 40 kg per meter squared. And so many obesity paradox studies suggest that the paradox falls apart with the very extreme levels of obesity. And, and finally, although our study had a decent number of patients, 2066, an average follow-up of just over two years. Certainly, a larger study with longer follow-up would give us even more statistical power. In conclusion, despite these study limitations, I think we can come to four major conclusions. First, our study indicates that cardiorespiratory fitness in heart failure patients significantly alters the relationship between adiposity and subsequent prognosis or total mortality. Second, just like we showed previously in coronary heart disease, 
patients with heart failure and high fitness have a good prognosis and don't seem to have an obesity paradox, whereas the low fitness patients have a much worse prognosis and a strong obesity paradox exists, whereas the uh, patients with low fitness and lower BMIs had by far the worst prognosis. Third, studies that assess the, the relationship between obesity and subsequent prognosis, if they're lacking information on car cardiorespiratory fitness, then their results may be quite misleading, and this needs to be taken into account. And finally, and very importantly, efforts to improve physical fitness, particularly to improve cardiorespiratory fitness, but also probably to improve muscular strength, and that's with exercise training, both aerobic or dynamic training, uh, as well as isometric or resistance training. To improve total physical fitness will go a long way to improve the prognosis in patients with cardiovascular disease, including those with heart failure. Thank you very much. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on healthcare at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.